from just a minute ago. He said mm -hmm. he said he was getting ready to get on. Um, okay, hopefully, good. he will not have trouble moving through the links. I just cool. texted texted Terrence, um, but I haven't heard back from him, so I don't okay. know, you know where he is. But uh, okay, yeah, brother Efren Guan. Just so, just so everyone knows, we are, um, everyone in the waiting room is able to hear us at this point. Okay, good. Yes, sir. There's a history, you, you and I, we, we have talked um, quite a bit. Uh, you remember uh, the um, dirty cop by the name of Rafael Perez? <laughs> yes. What we are seeing is his offspring. They got him. They didn't get everybody. Plain and simple. Plain and simple. For those who don't know, um, I encourage you to do a Google search, uh, Rafael Perez. Uh, for those who don't know, if you remember a movie uh, entitled Training Day, um, starring uh, Denzel Washington as um, uh, as uh, the principal actor, uh, Dirty Cop Alonzo. I forgot his last name. Anyway, Rafael Perez, Alonzo's um, Danza Washington's character, Alonzo, was based on Rafael Perez. And they did give him a shout out in the movie. His initials were on Alonzo's, Danza Washington's character's car. His license plate had his initials. Hmm. Well, King Kong, King Kong ain't got nothing on me, Solomon. That's all I can say. Man. Hey, man. That's right. That's King right. Kong, King Kong ain't got nothing on me, man. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Misha, good to see you, dear. Welcome. Likewise. Good evening. All right. So I saw Hawk getting on here a minute ago. I saw his audio connecting, but then he dropped off. Okay. Uh, Okay, I'm slowly but sure. There he's coming again. Okay. Outstanding. All right. Very good. What happened to Hawkins again? Dr. Mendez, how you doing, sir? Can't hear you. Is he muted? No, I don't think so. Okay, his audio's connected, okay. But Hawkins keeps on going in and out here, so. Hmm. Kelly, you want to try to reach out to, to Black Hawk Rising here and see why he's Black Hawk down right now? Yes, yeah, I am. Okay, yeah, I see him coming again trying to connect to audio. Mm -hmm. And Reverend Mendez, um, your audio is not connected right yeah, now, so I we're not going to be able to hear you. Got to hear the elder. That's right. I'm trying to figure. Yeah, I see it's trying to connect. Hawk, are you there, brother? Hey, what's up, y'all? My man, absolutely. How we doing, Hawk? Doing pretty good. What's up, Solomon? Good, good. How was the Midwest? It's cool, man. It's cool. Outstanding, outstanding, outstanding. Are we going to get any video from you, man? Nah. Just your audio. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll be on in a sec. Yep. Okay, okay cool. Right. I just want to make sure, because I'm going to pitch one of the first questions to you when we get started with the panel conversation. OK. Am I right. still doing uh, like a grounding piece at the beginning? I think I saw a message about uh, it. I definitely don't have to. <laughs> I don't yeah. see that on here. Well, okay, you know what, actually we do have you doing a grounding. So right. that's what I'll go to you for. And I may pitch the initial question to somebody else then. So yeah, one or the other, man. We'll kind of see how things flow. I'm not wedded strictly to these um, these schematics. So we'll kind of see how things move, okay? All right. All right, cool. 
because frankly, some of what you're likely going to share in a grounding statement will speak to my first question. So I may pitch that and then let you just start us off. Okay. Okay. Right, Reverend Doc, Clark, are you ready to go live? Hold on. Hold on. Doc, what's going on with your audio? Because I see it's still trying to connect. And somebody reach him because I think if you're trying to connect to audio, you may not be able to hear either. No, I, I, yeah, I know. It's a good so, point. Mary Pat and Kelly, both of you have his cell phone number because I sent it to y'all on email. I can call him myself, but then I can't do two things at once. So, one of you may need to call him and try to I'll talk call him. through this. Okay, go ahead. And well, call like him. he's connected, it's like it's trying to connect now. But, well, it's been doing that uh, though for a minute, Kills. That's my concern. It's been doing that for a minute. I, I'm calling. All right. Mary Pat, yeah, it's 631. Let's go ahead and go live, okay? Okay. Let me know I'm wrong. Are we on? Almost. Okay. All right. We are on. I just got notification. Your life. All right. Good evening to everybody. I want to thank all of you. I see the numbers rising as to those who are joining in. And we are, I believe, streaming live on Facebook uh, as well. I am Paul Robeson for the uh, chair of the board at this time, Action for Equity. It is my honor to welcome all of you on behalf of Action for Equity to this important roundtable conversation uh, that we are having about violence intervention, about collapsing the school to prison pipeline, and about how we best respond to this moment in the wake not only of the shooting at Mount Tabor, but so many other incidents that have been receiving coverage uh, in our media here locally and the longstanding issues that we have had in certain sectors of our community uh, with community violence, particularly that which affects our young people. We have really distinguished an important gathering of speakers here um, tonight. I'm gonna allow each of them uh, to introduce themselves uh, as they make their initial remarks, but we have a lot to talk about today. And so I don't want to delay uh, at all. And so we're going to get right to it with our first uh, young lady to give remarks is Misha James, who is going to share uh, my dream of a liberated education. Now, before she does that, I saw a comment here in the chat line that somebody couldn't hear me. Uh, I'm not sure what that's about, but um, Mary Pat, maybe you can check the audio on this. My, I am unmuted, but I saw somebody say they can't hear me. So uh, make sure on your own devices, if you're watching us, you turn your, your volume all the way up and um, hopefully we won't have any trouble. But Sister James, so glad to have you here uh, this evening. If you can just go ahead and introduce yourself and your organizational affiliation what brings you here tonight and share your dream of a liberated education. Good evening, everyone. I am Misha James, but the one who is sharing their dream of a liberated education is Makai James, my son. So I'm going to allow him to speak. Welcome, Makai. Thank you. I'm Makai James. I'm a senior at Mount Tabor High School, by the way. Uh, there's, I feel that there's almost, there's a lot for a person to learn, but I think that at Mount Tabor, I'm experiencing a liberated education. My history teachers, whether they were white or black, have always challenged the uh, content and the materials that we learn from. They acknowledge that uh, what's missing and how it's missing pieces of black history. Uh, I was afforded the opportunities and freedoms to challenge decisions with my African-American female assistant principal. Uh, her name is Clemens. And instead of offering immediate discipl disciplinary action, she treating me as one of her biological children, but she gave me direct conversations and she gave me opportunities to correct my mistakes instead of putting something on my record that won't leave. 
also my black football coaches had a different educational experience. It pushed them to be more transparent with the team and with us individually. Uh, I have conversations with my dad a lot about some parts of black history that a lot of people don't even know or they just choose not to talk about. <clears throat> my therapist, his name is Rashawn. He was always real with me and about the challenges he continues to face emotionally. And despite owning a successful practice, the challenges that he faces professionally, it, it's crazy because like he's the only one that really looks like him. He's really the only one that's successful out here that's really black as a as a community. We really don't believe in therapy. And I feel like but he and his team have been very supportive of me and my family. They made sure that what we talk about is discreet. And that's just because we aren't that far removed from the mental health stigma. And it really relates to black students like me. So despite me not always feeling like it, or sometimes I want to wake up early in the morning on a Saturday, the meetings with the YMC, CDA Black Achievers, they really help. The Crosby Scholars African American Males Pursuing Educational Dreams Program has helped. And being with the Winston Salem for Psych County Schools Equity Advisory Committee has also helped. And it, they allowed me to use my voice and made me feel like it's needed and that people can hear me and I'm helping somebody. I also learned from my mom that these opportunities and experiences haven't been available to people. So I'm thankful that I'm able to show up as I am and let my voice be heard. So I guess my dream for a liberated education would be that all students will have the freedoms and opportunities I've had and seen and celebrated particularly at a place that they spend eight or more hours a day for 180 days out of a year for 13 years. So also that their teachers will have the freedoms to teach them honest American history and not <clears throat> what someone is giving to them, but the real thing. And there's much more to learn, but I'm just grateful for the opportunity and the communities that are here to listen to what Excellent brother. Thank you so much for sharing. And that gives us a real framework for what we're thinking about tonight, because this is the type of opportunity, this is the type of education that we want for all of our young people within the winston Salem for Scythe County School System. And we understand that the work that we are doing to try to direct uh, our community away uh, from some of the default moves we have tended to make over the years when we run into challenges such as community gun violence, are critical to making sure that we keep the focus on nurturing and fostering the type of atmosphere and environment uh, so that Brother James is not the only one who is experiencing uh, that type of education. So thank you again, my brother. I want to welcome Reverend Timothy Bates from Nightcrawlers. Reverend Timothy Bates from Nightcrawlers, who is going to make a short presentation for us, if you will. Yes, sir. Good evening to uh, everyone. Just want to say thank you to Minister Muhammad to, uh, uh, for the invitation. Um, I am Pastor Timothy Bates. Uh, I'm out of Rowan County um, uh, in Idaho County. I uh, pastor two churches in Idaho County, um, Calvary Presbyterian Church and um, Cameron Presbyterian Church. Um, but I'm a community activist and I connected with uh, uh, Minister Muhammad through the Night Crawlers program, which is a prayer ministry that we go out uh, Friday nights and we are uh, in the neighborhoods, most of the neighborhoods that are uh, dealing with uh, gun violence. Um, we meet the families where they are. Uh, we offer them our uh, uh, motto is prayer, praise and presence. We just want to have a presence in the neighborhood. We want to speak to our young men. Um, we deal directly with uh, uh, gang members. We partner with the uh, police department here for ceasefire um, and those type of initiatives. Um, and we, um, every time there's a, uh, some type of uh, gun violence or some type of uh, uh, crime that's committed, uh, night crawlers are expected to be on the scene um, and present uh, to help with that, uh, whatever's going on in that, in that area. Uh, but the other initiative that I have is Man Up Monday that deals more directly with the school systems. And with the Man Up Monday initiative, uh, we go to the school. It originally was just supposed to be on a Monday morning uh, as motivation. It's very intentional uh, to be Monday because after the weekend, the students are lacking. Um, it was a 
push to the uh, brothers uh, to get black males in the school system, um, live action, while things are going on um, to interact with the students. We have 16 schools here in Rowan County. We're active in every school. Uh, we were before COVID uh, hit, and um, but we're, we're, we're just there. And the thing that we are is we're present. Um, and we, um, uh, the new word, I guess, is interrupt us. And we intentionally um, interrupt. Uh, we're very uh, flexible as to whatever the needs of the schools are needed. Uh, we talk to them about, uh, I got a board behind me. I'm, I'm a vision type person. Uh, some of the things that we, we've done, if you can see the board, uh, we did a million man march with the with the uh, elementary school where we had firefighters, police officers, um, all uh, facets of life to come in to teach. Um, another initiative that we have, we have what we call a tie Tuesday. Every Tuesday we go into school and every student uh, wears a tie. And um, the uh, violence, the uh, con conduct of the uh, students all change simply by they have, having a tie. Uh, put on them. We also deal with uh, young ladies, dealing with them with their um, self-esteem. And so we give our shirts because I am pretty, I am smart. Uh, the young men that work with me come from all walks of life. Uh, we have a barber, one of them works there in Winston-Salem uh, that, that, that works with us. We have a banker, a financial manager. We have a, a guy that uh, does a um, um, he does our training, our, our physical. We do mind, body, and soul. The soul is what we do. Um, and so what we do is we go into the school and we put them in military um, uh, formation. And in military formation, uh, we do right face, left face, attention. Uh, we, we, and once we do that, we let them become the leaders of the group. And so what we do, <clears throat> we hit every middle school with lunch buddies. We greet them at the... Um, at the bus stop, uh, uh, we got ministers, a part of the group, uh, black, white, uh, a part of the group. We, we take them, we do table etiquette, uh, every facet, whatever that teacher. And it's not only for the students, it's to let um, the teachers understand and the administration to understand that, um, uh, that you don't have to be afraid of black males that there are some positive black males in the community. The other, <clears throat> other thing, and I'll be done in a minute, that, 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 that we really do is that we touch on what the young man talked about. Um, we mediators. Instead of them going to the office, they bring them to Man Up Monday and they allow us to give them gang member over here, gang member over there. Allow us to get in the middle, talk to both sides, bring them back together, and it's been very successful what, we do, what we're doing. We've been doing this for over 10, 15 years. Um, and so um, Minister Muhammad uh, has been a part of it and he wanted me to bring it forth. And that's basically what we do. Reverend Bates, thank you. First of all, it's a pleasure to meet you and thank you for sharing uh, that work. Uh, there has been, of course, national attention brought to this very type of work with the dads on duty down in Louisiana. Yes, the conversations that we are having here locally in terms of some of the proposals right now to the Women's Gun Violence Prevention Coalition focused directly on this type of mentoring engagement, putting brothers in the schools in order to be a positive force and a diversionary force so that we don't have to have our young people having encounters uh, with the juvenile justice system, which is something we want to avoid at all costs. So thank you, Reverend Bates, for the work that you're doing and for sharing that with us tonight. And I very well may come back to you to ask you some questions <laughs> later on. So stay with us, all right? Yes, sir. All right, all right, very good. As we get, um, as we get moving here, um, I want to open up one of the discussions, and I'm going to ask Terrence Hawkins by way of a grounding statement um, for you to talk a bit about why this conversation here tonight is important. There's a lot of conversations going on around this issue here locally, a lot of voices that we're hearing, 
why is this conversation important? How does it fill a void that seems to be missing or underrepresented in the narratives that are dominating the local news since the shooting at Mount Tabor and other incidents that have happened? And if you wouldn't mind kind of weaving some consideration of that into your grounding statement, I would greatly appreciate it, all right? Absolutely. Can y'all hear me okay? I am um, Perfect. away from home and the internet is not so great where I am. So if we have problems, just give me a signal. <laughs> You're good um, so far. Okay, great. So my name is Terrence Hawkins. I am the founder of Lit City Youth Development and um, help lead another collective of activists called Drum Majors Alliance. And I always approach this conversation about our young folks, um, specifically black and brown young folks, that they are not problems to be solved. They are treasures to behold that a loving and just village is called to help unfold. And I always start there because there is a tendency because of anti-Blackness, uh, because of uh, some of our uh, classist views of some of our kinfolk, and because of our childism, our unwillingness to see the humanity of young folks, there's a tendency for us to approach them as though they are a problem, first and foremost. And when you approach the conversation as though young folk are primarily a problem, you gloss over and miss their promise and you gloss over and miss their trauma. And so I believe this, this conversation is extremely important uh, for one simple reason. If we don't have young flourishing people in our community, if they're not being supported, if the conditions aren't being created for them to grow and develop and come alive to their purpose, we really don't have a future. And so on that level, it's deeply, deeply important. And beyond that, a village that fails to show up for its young folks is really a village that is signing over, um, it's basically signing its own death wish. And so this conversation is important um, and it's important on so many levels, but I, I'll just close with, with this, these last couple of thoughts. Um, we live in a moment where our city is struggling. Um, the pandemic has been called many things. One thing I've called the pandemic is a pressure cooker. Um, for a year, our young folks were out of the classroom. They were at home while mama, daddy, auntie, grandma, granddad were probably at work. They're unattended, trying to engage the educational system through Zoom, sometimes with shoddy internet, sometimes with just bad habits as young folks, young folks developing the discipline, all those things at play. And then you add economic anxiety. Uh, you add an, an undeveloped uh, cere cerebral cortex. Um, you add a media machine that literally is set towards poisoning the minds of our young folks uh, with all kinds of ideas that aren't about healing, but are more so about keeping this deaf culture alive that this nation is founded in. When you get all of that mixed together, it is not, it doesn't take much to understand why we are in the place we're in as it relates to violence in our communities, violence in our schools. It is the fruit of the seeds that this city has sown. The city has not sown the seeds necessary for young folks to flourish, uh, specifically our black and brown folks. Um, and so we need in this moment to not only do that personal work, um, Lit City does mentoring. Lit City does leadership development for young folks. Lit City does sports camps. We do arts. We do all of that stuff. All of that stuff is grand, needed, necessary. But the thing that has to happen in this conversation is attention to the structural conditions. Um, we have to pay attention to the context because there is no peacemaking without um, looking into the context. And the context, I believe, and most of us believe, is a context of un injustice that engenders, that bears the fruit of this violence. And so we've got to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. We've got to be able to mentor and show up at the school board at the same time. We've got to be able to um, show up 
for our young folks when they're in crisis and do violence interruption work. We also need economic redistribution. We need jobs with livable wages. We need um, a robust investment in our communities to actually see this problem overcome. And I'll stop there. Black Hawk, Black Hawk, rising as always. Thank you so much, brother, for framing uh, you know, our conversation as we move into these questions. And I want to pitch it to you, brother Ephra Guam. How do we deal with the death culture? How do we deal with the death culture that Hawkins made reference to in such a way that we nurture life and vitality among our young people? First of all, greetings and uh, thank you, Reverend Ford, and of course, Action for Equity for hosting this most important uh, discussion. Um, in terms of dealing with the deaf culture, we have to do the opposite. We have to alpha life. Um, our young people and our youth, they are not afraid of death because they deal with it every day. Uh, so uh, we have to speak life into their hearts and into their minds and into their souls because the work is truly uh, has to be a transformational work that begins with one man and woman talking to the next young man and young woman. Um, you know, um, but in terms of that deaf culture, we also have to understand that there are forces on the outside that kind of encourage that deaf culture. And so we have to understand that that is a reality. And just real brief, um, I want to read something uh, in line with your question. I didn't know you were going to ask that, but I wanted to bring up Dr. King uh, in terms of the deaf culture is a culture of darkness. And Dr. King gave uh, an analysis that I'm sure you're very well aware of, Reverend Paul Ford, and I'm sure the great Reverend John Mendez, who I look forward to hearing from. Uh, in 19, uh, August uh, 15th, 1967, before the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And he kind of capsulizes that death culture, but in the terms of the darkness. And he says, if the soul is left in darkness, sin, sins will be committed. The guilty is not he who committed the sin, but he who caused the darkness. The policymakers of the white society, specifically referring to white supremacy, have caused the darkness. They created the discrimination. They created the slums. They perpetuate the unemployment. Ignorance and poverty. It is incontestable and deplorable that Negroes have committed crimes, but they are born of the greater crimes of white society. And he referred to those crimes as being derivative crimes. So much of what we see with our youth in the deaf lifestyle, both in the community that is now spilling over into the school and the schools in the community, we really can't lay the blame on our youth. Uh, there's a proverb that says that the child that is not, you know, welcome to the village or invited into the village will burn <laughs> down the village, right? Uh, so that, that deaf culture, we have to replace it with a life culture. Uh, violence is born out of uh, the mother of despair and hopelessness is violence and the deaf culture. And I think Brother Terrence, he, you know, he he definitely highlighted that that our young people over the last eighteen months have really been targeted with a lot of forces from the music, right? <clears throat> the music that many of our young people are listening to uh, here in Forsyth County is a form of music that came out of the South side of Chicago called drill rap, which literally promotes murder. The young people over the last 18 months have been fed a study, study diet of marijuana that is not like the marijuana, well, that some of us may have puffed on back in the day, 
the THC level in the marijuana that our young people are smoking is sometimes 50%, 80%, 70%, What does that level of THC do to the developing brain of a 13, 14, 15 year old? Also over the last 18 months, as Brother Terrence stated, our young people have been listening to this kind of music, smoking and then taking in these type of chemicals. And they've been looking at videos like Grand Theft Auto, which literally teaches you how to do drive-by shootings. So we have to replace that by taking them out of that environment and instilling into them a sense of self-worth a knowledge of themselves and doing some of the things that my good friend, uh, Pastor Bates, uh, stated that they're doing there in, 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 in Salisbury. And it begins by love. We just have to love on them more than the enemy is hating on them. Thank Very you. good, brother. Thank you so much. Brother David, I want to go to you, Justin, thinking about Brother F. Guam talked about, uh, you know, one man and woman talking to a young man and woman this kind of one-on-one -on -one work, this face-to-face -face contact, uh, this the relationships uh, on that local one-on-one -on -one level, how does that nurture the love that we've got to instill in our young people who may be caught up in the throes of the death culture? And, and how does some of the work that you've been doing for years really exemplify some of that? Well, first of all, buenas noches to everyone. Good evening to all. Um, thank you. Rev, thank you to Action for Equity for everything they're doing from bringing us together. It's very important because um, cultural competency is something real important that a lot of our people in our community do not know. And you can't love on someone or you can't hate on someone or you can't judge no one if you don't know about them. If you don't even understand what's really going on in someone's life, it don't matter if they're black or brown or white. If you're not in their communities, if you've never been in their position in their shoes, who are we to judge them? Who are we to condone them? Who are we to call them assassins? Where are we to, to say that, you know, they're just gonna continue to be gang members and murderers if you haven't tried? Some of the work that I do is preventive work. Um, I'm a mentor and director of a, a mentoring program called Beating Up Bad Habits, which is a boxing program where we take kids off the streets and we put them in a safe haven, get them away from the, norm, okay? And when I say norm, it's because they're used to it, they're accustomed to, but this is something that no one should live in, in a community where there's drive-bys, where there's murder, where there's, you know, dope being sold. Like if it was water or bread, or if it was just anything normal that we all can see around the community, going to the store. These individuals, yes, they're getting it from the music. Yes, they're getting it from the videos but they're getting it from their own community, their own society is what they're watching, is what they're seeing. So to them, it becomes okay. Some of these individuals are dealing with broken homes, community, society that really don't have no upbringings from, don't have no type of potential, have no resources for them. There lacks a lot of um, male influence in some of these individuals due to incarceration, due to deportation, due to crime. A lot of mothers, a lot of women are forced to be fathers like mine was. Um, my mom was a single mother and um, she worked from nine to nine and she just couldn't be home to tell me, don't go out, stop doing this, don't do that. There was just nobody home. And I see that happening every day and it's not too much the fault of a parent because they're trying to work and they're trying to do as much as they can to provide for the children. But at the same time, they have to spend a little bit of time. And if they can't, then look for the resources, look for the people in our community because we can always be there. There's always somebody that wants to help, but we do need more resources. To this death thing, this question that you said is just ridiculous because our kids, especially one that I spoke to the other day coming out of Parkland, there was a situation there and I was called to the scene. I said to him, if you keep living this life, you keep doing what you do, you're gonna end up dead or in jail. That life ain't gonna leave you nowhere. And I've said this to many kids in the past eight to nine years, 
And a lot of them have told me the same thing. I'm not afraid to die. I said, what? He says, I'm not afraid to die. I said, why? He says, I don't know. I said, well, you want to go to jail? He said, no. I said, well, why you don't want to go to jail? What, what, what's so afraid about being alive and being incarcerated? You get free meals, you get this, you get that. For whatever reason, they're afraid to be in jail, but they're not afraid to die. I mean, they're not afraid to die. And that broke my heart. We try to work with them and teach them that the value of life, you know, that they can be better, that we can really mold them and, and teach them that whatever's been going on can be changed. And we have to do that by taking them out their atmosphere. Um, with Brother Efren Guam Muhammad, with my brother Artemis Peterson, with Enough is Enough, the 10,000 Fearless, my organization, New Life, New Vida, for the past four or five years, we've been in these streets working and going hard. I remember six years ago, and I got a video, okay? I spoke out to certain organizations, law enforcement in this community, and I said, how can I help? What can we do to be more involved, more you know, preventive? You guys are the professionals. Show me, help me. What can we do? And they said, there's nothing to be done. They're going to be who they are. Once a gang member, always a gang member. But now they say that, you know, it's getting out of control. The murders are up. Everything is going on. Now they want us to help. Now they're asking us to join and be a force that these individuals would listen to. But this whole time we were saying it to them. And it's sad because the crime in our community is becoming an epidemic, just like the opioids was. These doctors, these pharmaceutical companies flooded our streets with dope, with synthetic heroin. And then later they said, oops, sorry. Now we have to change. Now we have to do something. The pandemic with COVID has turned this world, this country upside down. But crime has been doing this day after day, ever since we can remember in our 80s, our 90s, even in the 60s, when there were so many different organizations, you know, the Black Panthers, the Latin Kings, different stuff like that, that at one point stood for the community that were really for their people, you know, were forced to be the bad guys because law enforcement, society, the government, everybody else didn't want a change because crime pays. And now that it's out of control, they come to us and now they want us to help. They breeded this, but only we can help because it's a community, it's a village it takes. And these kids listen to us because we have the cultural competency that it takes. Brother David, thank you so much for that mighty testimony, those powerful words. You point to a question that really comes up here, which is, is this really a new issue, a new problem? Is this not something that we have been challenged to face before? And there's a couple of folks that I want to chime in on this. First, uh, Brother Solomon Quick, uh, to talk a little bit about the work that you did in the past and trying to have a voice heard uh, to the very perspective that Brother David was just talking about and where the opportunities were that we missed at that point, how we can learn lessons from that past as we move forward in this moment here. Um, thank you, Pastor Ford. Um, first off, um, I'd like to um, speak to uh, Brother Makai, um, Micah's son. Um, young man, I'd like to apologize to you. I'd like to apologize you for the adults and what we have not done. There is no excuse for what happened in Mount Tabor. There's no excuse for where we are right now. We as adults have the capacity, have the resources and have the contacts to make this concern go away. And we simply have not done that. So on behalf of myself, I don't wanna to speak to anybody else, for anyone else. I'd like to apologize to you for what we have not done because there is no excuse. Um, to your point, Pastor Ford, we have been here before. We have had similar issues, maybe not to the graphic degree, but 
in years past, the number one thing that we have to focus on, and we've tried to turn this focus before, we have to move away from looking at our gang issues, our gang concerns as a public safety issue. Throw that mindset away. We have to turn from that to we looking at gangs as a public health concern. Now, what does that look like? That's simple. We're in the middle of a pandemic. Obviously, that's a public health concern. But when you deal with things from a public health lens, you look at things such as what are the risk factors? What are the warning signs? What are, where are and what are the current or potential hotspots for gang activity? And what resources do we need to flood with said communities to turn that around? With regard to warning signs, there is no one profile for any ethnicity, gender, demographic to be a gang member. But if you have multiple risk factors, I don't care if you're in Winston-Salem, I don't care if you're in Charleston, West Virginia, I don't care if you're in Santa Fe, New Mexico, if you have the multiple risk factors, you are gonna have a gang issue. And that's what we have attempted to deal with in years past, probably 10 years ago. Now is the time for those concerns to be heard because it will not get any better. And I don't mean to speak doom and gloom, but I gotta be honest. It will not get any better if we do not learn from the history of looking at this thing as a public safety concern expecting law enforcement to solve it. They cannot. And frankly, they know they can't. They can control it to an extent, but they will never solve our gang concerns. It is impossible for law enforcement to solve a gang concerns because the origin of our gang concerns did not start with them. Thank you, Brother Solomon. And one of the things I basically just heard you say here at the end, and, and Valerie, I'm going to ask you to kind of come in and, and comment on this, is that we cannot police our way to peace. We cannot police our way to peace. Impossible. One of the concerns a lot of us have had about the narrative that seems to be dominating in some of the local airwaves does suggest that we can police our way to peace, whether it's by expanding the SRO program, whether it's by tossing around all kinds of ideas from dogs on campuses to metal detectors to all sorts of other things that may speak to people's anxieties, may speak to people's fears in the moment, uh, but the real question as to whether or not they're actually gonna lead to lasting peace. Valerie, if you can speak from the perspective of tribe restorative justice and the, the lens that your work there brings to questions of wrongdoing, harming communities, this sort of thing, and speak to that question, I appreciate it. Sure. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for, for this discussion that we're having. Um, I appreciate um, Mr. Quick's um, analogy of looking at this as a, a public health concern instead of a public safety concern. Because I think that is um, definitely kind of the, the way, the direction we need to kind of um, be going in these discussions. Um, at Triad Restorative Justice, we um, uh, work with youth. We get referrals from our juvenile justice system when kids can get diverted from juvenile court um, and come to us. We get kids who've been involved in school-based offenses that are coming to us. Um, we also work with youth who are not involved in the justice system as well with some leadership and youth development as that. So um, we have um, gotten a chance to see what the current context is um, with our youth and how things are being addressed and handled. Um, and like we said, we do often kind of take a, an approach where we're thinking about um, when we have the way our traditional justice system looks at things and 
And we kind of, um, our traditional justice system is really looking at kind of what are the rules that were broken? What are the laws that were broken? Um, who is the person who broke those laws? And then what kind of punishment do they deserve? And it's, it's really focused on those things. Um, and most of that punishment is a, is a punishment that pushes people out of that community. Um, we're looking at, you know, suspensions, expulsions, um, all kinds of other ways that being involved in the justice system pushes kids out, um, sometimes physically out of our community. And sometimes it's more about the labels that they then carry with them after that happens that continues to make them feel like they don't belong and they're not connected um, and they're not a valued member of that community. Uh, with restorative justice, so restorative justice is a relationship based way to look at justice and recognizing that we are, our communities are made up of relationships between people. We're not a foundation, we're not a society that's built upon laws, that we are communities built upon relationships. And when there is wrongdoing that, that happens, when harm occurs, that there's, that's a violation of the relationships between people. It's not a violation of a law. Um, and to really focus on what justice is, justice is about healing that violation. What needs to happen to heal? What is the repairs that can be made to the extent possible? Um, and finding ways for the people who have been directly harmed to find healing, to be able to say, this is what I need um, in order to, to move on, in order for healing to happen. These are the repairs that need to happen. Um, it's a way for the person who caused that harm to say, this is what I can do to make repairs. Um, this is what I can do to be better. Instead of kind of this, um, or traditional system that kind of tells people what to do, like this is your punishment, this is what you're gonna do. With restorative justice, it's about empowering the people to think about how they've impacted others and um, come up with ways that, of what they can give to that situation, um, what they can give to bring healing. And so it's an empowering way and it helps them to see their value as a community member and see how they are connected. And as those relationships are mended, um, and in healthy ways, then that's it strengthens them, their role in the community and they're not feeling outside the community, they're feeling connected to the community. Um, and that's what we are striving to do. And that involves both having that strong community in the first place so that people feel connected. Um, and then when conflict happens, are we responding in ways that help people to, to heal, help people to feel stronger, um, help that commu those community connections to be stronger when this is all over? Um, and to provide the supports needed. And so we also talk yeah. about the role of the community here too. Um, and what role do we as a community have to build that community? What are our, what's our accountability in this role too? And I've heard that come up several times tonight um, and seen as we are the ones that build that community for our youth and we have that responsibility to meet their needs. So, so. And one of the models, Valerie, I, you know, I've studied uh, restorative justice quite a bit myself and, and, and worked in some areas. Is one of the models I know is the peace circles um, in situations where there's been an altercation, there's been a uh, you know, verbal fight uh, on school grounds, uh, somebody's got a beef going on. Sit folks down in a peace circle. Can you tell us a little bit more just briefly about the model of the peace circle and what it's intended to accomplish? Yeah, the, the peace circle is um, the way that the voices are participating in that process of what needs for he what do we need for healing to happen. Um, and in order for that to happen, people need to be able to have their voice in those situations. And so the Peace Circle is um, in the structure of it, right? It's a circle and it's one of um, a situation where we pass around a talking piece um, so that everyone has that opportunity to share if they want to share. They have a chance to share how the situation impacted them, um, what they think needs to happen in order for healing to take place, what they can bring to that situation to help for healing um, for others. And it's a chance for people from different perspectives to share that. So a peacemaking circle would include um, in, some, most, in some situations, you know, the person who caused harm, it can, cause, and it can also include people who were hurt by that. It can include people who are supporters or loved ones of those who are harmed um, and those who caused the harm. And it can also include people who were um, part of that community. So maybe they aren't the person directly harmed, but they're part of that community and they're part of that discussion because like we said, the community is an important part of that. Um, it gives voice for everyone. Um, and it's 
handled in a way where everyone's voice matters and everyone's voice is valued in that discussion. And so these are alternative folks to some of the defaults that we use right now. Uh, Brother David, I do see you have a question. I wanna get uh, Dr. Mendez in here though, um, initially, and then we're gonna start going around to some of the questions. There's some other questions in the chat room. Dr. Mendez, are you with us? Can, can we hear you? Uh, I don't know, can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you, Doc, I can hear you, very good. Okay, so listen, great. I wanna welcome Dr. John Mendez, retired senior pastor of Emanuel Baptist Church. Uh, his reputation speaks for itself. Doc, what I really want to ask you to speak to is this issue of relationships. There's a powerful story you shared with me. I don't know if you're comfortable sharing it tonight, but just that speaks to this issue of relationships with these young men, these young people, um, and how that should and will shift the way that we think about um, folks that are sometimes otherwise misrepresented, as has been said earlier, in some ways that really uh, just miss the mark and, and demonize young people um, instead of really looking at the opportunity to love um, and the opportunity to build relationships that nurture. So if you could just speak to some of that, as well as that historical vantage point as somebody who was working on these issues many years ago when we had surges of violence in the community. Yeah, yeah thank you, um, Dr. Ford, and to everybody that's um, part of this panel. Um, I think some really important things have been said um, as it relates to uh, some of the issues we're trying to address. Um, the first thing I wanna say is that um, I don't know why people are so surprised about when these issues happen. Uh, the first thing um, to acknowledge is that we're talking about an oppressed community of young people, of adults, where the issue of rage is always present. Parents trying to make ends meet, struggling, can't get time off to be with their children. Um, those issues are real. And um, many of our children don't get the kind of of support that they need. And there are three things uh, that you and I talked about uh, before, but there are three things that are needed uh, to develop um, um, important, well, to develop stable uh, young people. One is that it's gotta be positive mirroring. Um, they need to know, and I think some of the other organizations that were mentioned earlier um, are doing that. And it doesn't matter really where, um, which group it comes from, if they can get the attention, if they're recognized as uh, being important and what have you, all of this will work. Um, there's a need for positive mirroring. Our kids are told they're dummies, that they're uh, perceived as criminals, uh, they're treated like they're criminals even before a crime is committed. Um, and that goes back to what W.E.B. Du Bois talked about in uh, The Souls of Black Folk when he always felt that the, um, a lot of his peers wanted to ask him, how does it feel to be a problem rather than a person with problems? And we don't have that luxury of being perceived as people with problems, but we are perceived as a problem. We're criminals, whether we committed a crime or not, comes with the turf. The second important thing is the need uh, to be able to idolize others, um, to feel a sense of security, a sense of, of calm with one another. Um, young people need to idolize. If they don't idolize positive people, I see my brother, uh, Muhammad, who's here. When I was 15 years old, I would constantly go on 116th Street in Harlem where I grew up 
And when I had asked Minister Farrakhan to preach for me that Sunday, I reminded everybody that he never, never dissed me, but he always found, found time, he would always find time to talk to me about something. Um, it was that kind of intervention uh, that made a big difference. The third thing is um, what we call the um, um, alter ego. And that means dealing with like minds where we feel a sense of, of acceptance. Uh, you don't feel like a misfit. Um, but I can assure you, all whatever the issues are relates to one or three of those particular uh, needs that all of us need and have from the great from from the crib to the grave. Um, the other thing that I want to say: you cannot live in the hood, live in the ghetto live in slums, live in dilapidated houses, live in a, a, a community uh, where um, you know you are oppressed when you contrast it to what, what, what cross town looks like. You can't be in those kinds of situations and not experience shame. Comes with the turf. Um, but not just shame, but also if those three things that I just mentioned are not fulfilled, it creates within the individual narcissistic rage. And what I mean by that, an important term for young people is this. You diss me, you might get shot, mm. you might get jacked up, mm. all of that may happen. And that's not and that's inseparable from um, uh, feeling disrespected. If in fact, a lot of our young people do not identify with uh, what y'all talked about earlier, those organizations and, and connect with people like that, um, then they're gonna identify with Scarface they're going to identify with uh, the Godfather because they're, as whether it's gangs or not, they're looking for the same kinds of things that everybody else wants and everybody else has. Um, so that if they get respect through gangs, if they get money through gangs, et cetera, then gang banging is the way they will go. Uh, this city fails our young people in the sense that there's no investment in jobs. There's no investment in the uh, middle schools with sports and all those things that a lot of us used to have uh, growing up that kept you literally out of trouble. Um, one of the things that um, was very helpful to me, we had a community and there were a lot of black men in those communities. And they would share their street wisdom with a lot of us to keep us out of jail and to keep us out of trouble. We have to, and I think somebody alluded to it earlier, that we got to recognize what has been done to our communities. Now, let me go back to we had this problem back in the 90s. Clergy, law enforcement, and the community came together to work on the front end before a crime was committed rather than on the rear end. We met with the Winston Seller State and, and Wake Forest identified where most of the crimes were happening. We went there. We got involved. Um, parole officers gave us lists of names of, of young people to talk to. Um, I headed it off and, and talked to young people about what they were doing, but also we clergy were pissed 
because we're the ones that do all the funerals. We have to deal with grieving parents, et cetera. And we were ready to put an end to that. Um, law enforcement got involved not to arrest these young people, but to give them some alternatives and to help them to see if they wanted out of the gangs or whatever, we would help them. What I'm trying to say is we reduce violent crimes in this city to almost zip. In High Point, it was reduced to zip. And then we went around the country selling the program. We know how to do it. There has to be a commitment from the city, from the mayor on down, from the corporations and banks and businesses in this community uh, to listen to us. They don't know us. They don't know our young people. I never met a young person, gangbanger or not, who was born to be a game banger. Never wanted to be a game banger. I grew up in Harlem. I was in gangs and I hated the gangs. Mm. I joined the Egyptian crowns um, at a young age, but there was a trauma, a trauma that motivated me to do that. Most of our young people in our communities are traumatized. And once trauma becomes unconscious, it drives the behavior just the same. So what I'm trying to say is that in a nutshell, why are we surprised when young people kill each other? It's easier. The, uh, Paulo Freire talks about um, a horizontal violence. Franz Fanon talked about violence. The violence begins in your spirit before it becomes an external act. Oppression, and this is what we have to attack, the nature of oppression. Oppression turns you against yourself and makes you participate in your own oppression. Our struggle is how do we move our young people from being against themselves to being for themselves? And it's gonna take all of us coming together to figure this thing out. And we know what to do. We understand, we know our young people. We know where they're hurting. We know where their, where their pain is. And unless we begin to address that, I don't care whether or not the city or those folks do it or get it right. We as black folk got a responsibility to save ourselves. And there are a lot of white people who get it and understand it and want to participate in trying to make a difference as well. I just got back from a two, three week trip with the Apache native people out in Arizona. They're going through the same kinds of experiences that we are, um, Hispanic community. In other words, where there is oppression, people suffer and people hurt. And that's the motive behind all of this. If I'm hurting, I want somebody else to hurt. If they're hurting, they want somebody else to hurt. I mean, it just, continues to accumulate um, into a huge mountain of pain and violence. But also after 36 years of pastoring, I've seen people change. I've watched young people change. I know what we can do to make it change. And those of you that spoke earlier, you get it, you got it. And um, we just need to come together. I appreciate Dr. Ford pulling us uh, together, but we need to meet together to talk about a plan of action. And we need to force the city, put the pressure on the city to stop creating oppression in, in these hoods where people turn against themselves. And then we want to report it in the newspaper as if there's something wrong. Uh, with all of us. White kids are killing white kids. 
but they don't get the kind of publicity that our children get in our communities and whatnot. But oppression carries the same response, um, the same laws of action for any group that's oppressed. Thank you for letting me say this. Doc, thank you so much for that word that you just preached. We got lots of hands clapping here, both on and off mute. And there's so much there, but, but a couple of things I think that really resonate with what we have discussed so far, and then I think will help carry us into the latter half of this conversation, is what happens when our young people are dealing with internalized trauma and the trauma becomes unconscious and shifts them to being against themselves instead of being for themselves. We talked earlier about the death culture. And I think the interconnection between those things are clear. But you also pointed to the fact that we know what to do because in the same period of time that you guys were doing what you were doing in the late nineties in this area, Reverend Jeffrey Brown and others up in the Boston area were a part of what has become known as the Boston miracle. That's okay. Right. And that's and where it started. I, that's where that, it started. And that's Boston, exactly. we went there to meet with them. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And what everybody needs to understand is the Boston miracle came in the wake of community violence that escalated to the point that after a young man was killed in a gang related shooting, the opposing uh, gang or that gang, you know, where the young man had been killed, came to retaliate against other folks that showed up to the funeral and shot up a church, a very prominent church on the south side of Boston, Morningstar Baptist Church. And in response to that, the community came together, community stakeholders, clergy, social services, criminal justice system representatives, police, everybody, to work in the same vein Dr. Mendez was talking about and brought uh, the level of violence down to almost nothing uh, over the course of a couple of years. And so I, I made this reference to the past and asked for folks like Brother Quick and Dr. Mendez to speak to the past, because as we said, A for E said in our initial statement following the Mount Tabor shooting, we should not be surprised that the Mount Tabor shooting happened. There were some who would even say it was inevitable that something like that was going to happen here mm -hmm. because of what has been going on in sectors of our communities for years. And so the key issue now is that we do not miss the window of opportunity and the moment. Because the fact of the matter is, if we continue on the lines of what Dr. Mendez, you all were working on in the late 90s and just kept that thing going, institutionalized it, embedded it in the culture of this city and the community leadership, funded it, supported it, so that it had uh, the strength to go on perpetuity, we probably never would have seen uh, what happened uh, a few weeks ago. So that goes back to the question I asked Brother Hawkins early on, why is this conversation so important? Because I'm not sure that we're hearing this conversation um, in a lot of the local conversations that are getting public attention. Uh, we cannot police our way to peace. So I do wanna start to try to address some of the questions that we have seen in the chat room and Q and A. Uh, Gordo, I know that you had a question for Valerie, and you may have some other thoughts now after hearing Dr. Mendez, but I want to turn it over to you um, to articulate your question um, and then speak to some of the other ones that have been put out there, and I'm going to ask different panelists if they can address them. So go ahead, brother. To me, right? That's you. It's you. First of all, I want to say thank you to Valerie for all the work that her organization doing, everybody else, um, all the organizations that are here on the panel tonight. Um, I'm definitely a fan of, of Valerie. Um, we were able to do a little work um, a couple of weeks ago, and I started doing some more research. Of course, I've heard of her program through Drug Corps and stuff like that. Um, I've been working with Judge Hartsfield for a long time. Valerie, what is it that some of the, these kids and these individuals tell your organization or, or show your organization a little bit of an insight of their world that gives you guys that urge to continue to work, continue to do what you do, 
And how is it that you can translate that to the city and to the stakeholders so they can understand where a lot of other organizations like mine come from. And when we try to tell them what we see, what we hear firsthand, we're not labeled or, or mislabeled for whatever it is that they think that we are instead of really being a voice of the young people. Um, I'll, I'll try to answer that and you can let me know if that's kind of um, what you're um, asking. Um, I think what, what we're hearing from kids, what we recognize in the stories we have with kids is, is just that, that basic need for some connection and relationship. I think is kind of the core thing is, um, you know, some of the programs we deliver that we have funding for, they like it because it's evidence-based and it has, you know, some of these buzzwords, but as our organization, the way we really gets down to it is that that's, that's just a way to build a relationship with a kid. It's a way to kind of get to the kids. Um, and our main focus is just building that relationship. Um, and we have kids who come back. One of our programs is an anger management class which is not, you know, I mean, like, I mean, it's anger management. It's not a super exciting kind of um, program. And we've had kids who want to come back and to do it again because they just liked the connection they had with our coordinator. They enjoyed having someone that would listen to them. Um, we've had other kids in some of our other programs say like, you know, I don't think anyone has ever listened to me this way before. Um, so just kind of that. And then that's just relationship. You know, that's just kids need someone to talk to Kids need someone to listen to them and to show them that they value that they're valued. To show them that they're important in someone's life, um, someone that can hear their concerns and take them seriously. Um, that's I think a lot of what we're we're hearing from kids and and kind of just working on the the issues that they're dealing with is someone that's there to kind of model just you know how are we dealing? With, they're struggling with their own relationships with their peers. Um, you know a lot of the things they're coming to us because they're having fights with each other. Um, they're not sure how to handle their own conflict, you know, how to you know, resolve conflict, how to deal with their own emotions, um, how they're responding when they're upset about things. So there's a lot of just kind of social emotional learning that, um, that they can use some development in um, as a way to kind of really support and kind of get on the other side of, of where they're at in the life right now. Um, as far as you know, how we can kind of get that message out, um, we're trying to you know find ways that we can lift up the voices of the youth themselves. Like, how are we getting them to tell their own stories um, and finding ways to do that? And that's something our organization is still, um, you know, trying to develop and to do a better job of is getting them to tell their own stories um, and trying to connect that yeah with the um, people who are part of making decisions and part of policies and trying to get those stories to those people um, and how that impacts their stories beyond data. So like, I think we're trying to get beyond the numbers and just the data of things, but to the stories that are behind those numbers. Very good, thank you. Uh, I know I saw that uh, Brother Solomon, Brother Everguan, both of you had your hands up. I wanna go to you guys before we start picking up some of these questions that I'm seeing in the chat and the Q and A. Start with you, Brother Solomon, and then Brother Everguan. Thank you. Um, one of the best kept secrets about what happened at Mount Tabor is the origin of it. The origin of it, as was shared with me, the Friday after it happened, I had a young man come to me and he told me scripture chapter and verse the following. It started over the summer because of bullying. It started because the young man who pulled the trigger at Mount Tabor was being bullied. No one came to his quote unquote rescue. In short, Dr. Mendez, that young man was traumatized by the bullying he experienced. And we as a community did not come to his aid. That was not his fault. We did not come to his aid, fair enough. I didn't know about it until after the tragedy happened at Mount Tabor. That's really, really important, I think, 
for us to recognize that he did not wake up just one day at random and decide to pick up a firearm and take it to school and shoot someone. That does not happen with any of our children. There's more that I can say, but I'll stop there in respect of time. Brother Efriquan. Thank you. First of all, I'm always uh, happy to be able to listen, uh, just even if it's at the feet of an elder, uh, such as the Reverend John, the great Reverend John, Dr. John Mendez, man. Um, but as everyone was talking about history, Reverend Paul Ford, you ask, is this earlier? Is this new? No, it's not new. America was forged in gun violence. The possession of North America was the result of gun violence. Moving indigenous people off of their land was the result of gun violence. Tulsa, Oklahoma, Rosewood, Wilmington was the result of gun violence. The powers that be don't have a problem with gun violence when they're using it, as Dr. Mendez said, to oppress people. They have no problem as long as the violence is contained in Northeast Winston or East Winston. And as tragic, and my heart and sympathy goes out to all of the students at Mount Tabor who had to witness what they witnessed. But what about the little students who all over the summer were witnessing homicides in their community? That's right. That's who right. rushed into their aid? Where was the national news attention there? Mm -hmm. And this is why history, a wise man once said, out of all of our studies, history is most qualified and attractive to reward our research. There's much more to it, but you all were giving the history. In 1988 or earlier, a group of men from the mosque in Washington, DC, and Washington, DC at that time was the murder capital of America, if you all remember. That's right. And there was a housing development called Mayfair Mansions. Yep. And our brothers from the mosque went in there, no guns, no weapons, but in love. And made it a place of peace to where the elderly could come back on their porch. Children could play at the playground, right? So as Reverend Mendez said, we know how to do this. However, history is very important because there were forces. As David said, crime pays. And when the brothers were doing that work in Mayfair Mansions in DC, it wasn't the drug dealers or the gangbangers that they so-called gangbangers that they had a problem with. It was rogue law enforcement and corrupt elected officials who benefited from the chaos that was going on in the community. That's why I mentioned Dr. King saying that you cannot blame uh, those uh, sins on the community. You have to blame them for those who are creating the darkness. So yes, we know how to do it, but we also have to ensure, since history teaches us, that we don't need those outside forces to continue to add fuel to a fire that they started that now they are asking us to put out because the fire is now affecting them. And so we have an opportunity. If we are truly serious about changing Winston-Salem and Forsyth County, because I think as you stated, uh, I think it was Brother Solomon, that if we don't get control of this, see, it's not going to be just limited to the north and the east side. Let me just be real straight about this. Mm -hmm. See, there's not there's 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 not too much more to take. But Buena Vista, Renoda, those who live in uh, gated communities who believe that those uh, gated communities make you safe. So I, I think that we need to be allowed, those of us who know our people, who understand them, 
especially our young people, be allowed to begin to clean up the mess that others made without hindering us. So I just wanted to say that particular part. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brother Efra. May I follow up? Uh, may I follow up on his comment, sir? Real quick, and then I want. I to promise. Follow. I promise. Right, I promise. Um, Brother Effinguan hit on the point, and I was very, very fortunate. I consider myself to be very fortunate to have a relationship with a young man who shared with me the root cause of the conflict. I was literally shutting down my place of employment, and he was just walking, and he, I've known him for years, the young man, and he just came up, and I said, you okay? And he was said, yeah, I'm all right. I was like, no, are you okay? And at that point, he it all came out. Had I not had a multiple, a multi-year trusting relationship with that young man, he would have never said a word to me. There's nothing special about me that makes that relationship possible. Pastor Ford, you have those relationships. Brother Efiquan, you have those relationships. God knows. Um, Elder Mendez has those relationships. Pastor Bates, you have those relationships. Brother Vita, you have those relationships. Why? Because the children, the young people know that we care. That's it. I'm done. Very good, man. Thank you. And one of our brothers that we have here is doing so much of this work who I know has been uh, watching. And I just want to see Artemis Peterson, otherwise known to many of us as Papa. If there's anything you want to contribute to this conversation based on what you've heard and what has really kind of hit your spirit in terms of resonating with the work that you've been doing alongside El Bordo and, and Brother Efra Guam and others. Anything you want to share, Papa? Should be able to. Uh, we should be able. To, all right, you're not. He's uh. He's still muted. Uh, Kelly, can we unmute him? Okay. If if not, if he's not on, there's something I want. I, I need to add. All right, um, go ahead. I can add that while we get him squared away. Okay. Um. Culture is important. Our foreparents organize a culture of resilience and resistance to all of the racism, institutional, institutional racism, well as segregation and all of that. And that kept us together. It kept us sane and it kept us um, in the struggle. One of the things that um, was very helpful to me, I mentioned uh, Minister Farrakhan earlier, but um, the church, the black church was very important um, as far as providing those three things that I talked about earlier, uh, mirroring, idolizing, and uh, common minds and what have you. Children, our children, and a lot of them are not in the black church right now, but a lot of them uh, would be, we used to be told you're nothing in school. But when you got to church, somebody said, boy, you got a head like a lawyer, or you got a head like a doctor, or to the women, you know, you're gonna be somebody. That's that kind of cultural affirming. Um, my neighbor got me into jazz mm. when I was about 12, 13 years old. When I got to be around 15, 16, I always had a mustache so I could get into the clubs. <laughs> Listen to John Coltrane, Sarah Vaughn, Betty Carter, Miles Davis, et cetera. I grew up with that. That was empowering. Some many years ago um, at church, one of the things we did with our after school tutorial, most of the kids did really good. Uh, Quick knows about this. Kids did really good that year. So we wanted to reward them 
their grades went up, they were doing well. There was an opera in town. I suggested we take the kids to the opera. Not that I thought they might like it, but they needed that exposure. We took them downtown first to a five-star restaurant. Most of them had not been downtown, let alone <coughs> talking about a, a, a five-star restaurant. They were on their best behavior. It was the first time we met the parents. They were dressed. They loved it. When we went to the opera, I assumed they would be sleep in the first scene. They watched the whole opera. On the way back home, I asked somebody to tell me what is the op what was the opera about? And little um, one young girl who was really um, uh, exhibiting problematic behavior, but she stood up in the van and told us what the opera was all about because they read in English the lyrics at the top of the um, stage. And that same young girl went back into her community and started emulating, and I did put her with some of our senior uh, citizens, she started emulating them in her community on her own. So what I'm saying is that these three things work. And all of you that got programs who are doing, um, who are affirming and giving hope to these young people, that behavior will change really quickly once those particular needs, you know, that young guy talked to you um, quick, <clears throat> probably because there was some idolization in, in, involved. And that's why I say it all comes back to one or three of those particular issues. Valerie, what you're doing um, is mirroring um, and, and giving young people, making young people feel like they're somebody. I, I know what Muhammad was talking about earlier. Um, I did, we did some of that. Um, and back in the 90s, when we went into the communities and whatnot, I'm saying we know what to do. It's a matter of us coming together to do it. Um, one of three of those issues got to be addressed and dealt with. I've seen too many young people die already. And it's not an absence of their <clears throat> oppression. It is associated with and part of the nature of oppression. And I wanted to say one last thing, that to be, live in the hood and appear vulnerable and weak is in fact to open yourself up to not only being bullied, but certainly taken advantage of. All I got to do is go back That's home right. to Harlem. Five minutes, I jump back into what I used to be. Start walking that way, acting that way, thinking that way. Um, it's a survival thing. That's right. And, and we got the, you know, mental health has failed our young people. They know. They understand what the issues are, but they're the most solid in this community. I went back to school and became um, a, a psychotherapist in the spirit of France Fanon to help bring healing to our community and to our kids. But we got to deal with the reality of it. Stop blaming the kids, but start blaming the systems, the that's nature right. of the environment. That's right. That's, you know, behind it all. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Doc. Papa, what do you have to add here? And then Sister James, I really want to come to you as you've heard all these great presentations and we heard from your brilliant young boy and, and really want to hear from you as a parent as to what all this means to you, a parent of one of our young people in the school system to think about it. Papa, what do you have to add to this conversation, brother? Oh, man. 
peace of blessings, man. You can hear him. Yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you. Right, okay, okay. Yeah, peace and blessings, man. It's an honor to be in the presence of y'all great voices, man. You know what I'm saying? And um, uh, you know, I just want to say, you know, just being that we we are in a real war. You understand what I'm saying? And um, you can't band-aid wars. You understand what I'm saying? These wars got to be put, uh, uh, put together appropriately, like the like the core and uh, that we are dealing with right now. It, it has to be sincere. It has to be pure and it has to be genuine. You understand what I'm saying? Well, the people that's been getting these sort these, these, these funds, that's what we need for our community, resource. Everything is a blank stare. And if it become and continue to be a blank stir, it's gonna continue to get worse. You understand what I'm saying? Because you have any form of emptiness has to void has to be filled. And it's a lot of empty void that we're dealing with at this moment. Yeah, yeah. You're on mute, Reverend Ford. So, Papa, you're you're muted, man. You got muted here in the middle of what you were saying. There you go. You want to finish that comment? We can. You should be able to. We should be able to hear you now. Okay, my problem is somebody was calling in. Hey, but uh, yeah, like I was saying though, just we that unification is important. Important. We can no one organization do it together, but a lot of genuine and pure ones can. And I think that's what we formulated the genuine and the pearls who really sincere in doing their work. Ain't excluding nobody work. You understand what I'm saying? But sometimes when it get to this point and the flame get to come and roaming all through the cities or whatever, it's time for everybody that's genuine to step up. And I, you know, I just want to apply act for equity and everybody else that, that was powerful enough to come together and try to come to a common solution, man. I appreciate you, brother. Sister James, go ahead, and then we're going to start going through a couple of these questions between the chat room and the Q&A. If you have more questions that you want us to try to get to in the last little time that we have together, go ahead and put those in the Q&A, and I'm also going to address some of the ones in the chat room. Uh, brother Bates, uh, Pastor Bates, just so you can get ready when I come to you after Sister James, there was a question earlier on. Uh, about your program in terms of the, uh, the Mondays and whether or not that is something, the Man Up Monday, whether or not that's something that happens at the elementary level. So you can just think about the answer to that. Sister James, go ahead. So good evening, everyone. Uh, I am Misha James. I host a blog that I write, makaismom.com, as well as a weekly blog, Ira Kijiji, where Kijiji stands for Village in Swahili. It is a subsidiary of Action for Equity, so I appreciate the opportunity um, from Kelly and many on this panel to share space with you. I come from a parental perspective uh, as a graduate of Mount Tabor and now a parent of a Mount Tabor student. It, in fact, was not a surprise. Um, it was a surprise that it didn't happen, the shooting didn't happen sooner than it did. Um, the surprise, and, and it's definitely not a surprise. The reaction is happening is saddening, but it's 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 not a surprise at the reaction. Uh, there was a murder here where we live uh, just last week, and the response we got from the property manager was disheartening because um, it was cold, wasn't sensitive to the situation because the victim nor the assailant lived on the property, and because they were of color, didn't live on the property, it was glossed over. We've not seen any um, continued police presence since because they don't feel that they're not safe. So if that can happen where we live, why can't that happen in school? It was an isolated incident. Yes, guns, weapons have been found since. But I feel because it happened at a predominantly white school in a predominantly white neighborhood, this is where the, the reaction, the knee-jerk reaction has happened and we see the increase of SROs. Are they needed? No. Um, and my main point is, are we asking the students what they want? Are we asking the students what they want and what they need? Are we asking, are we using the voices? And if we have asked, are we listening to them? Two days after they were out of school, they returned to school and they returned to a welcoming visit from people from the school board, um, sheriffs, deputies, police deputies. They didn't want that. They wanted to return to school as normal. And it hurt my heart 
that my son and some of his teammates and friends were less concerned, not that they were not empathetic to the situation that happened, but because they weren't surprised that it happened. It was, when can we go back to school? Because we can't afford another year of virtual learning like we did last year. So it wasn't that they, they weren't surprised that the situation occurred. Their thing was, well, it just shouldn't have happened on campus. As a parent, my thought is the situation should have never occurred. But this generation now is desensitized to the violence. So are we asking them what they need? When they went back to school, I understand they, they spent a period or two coloring. Well, his therapist that he mentioned earlier, he hosts coloring nights. But my son is aware of that because he has a therapist. My son is aware of that because he's been educated on it. Just to send students back to school and say, here's a sheet of paper and color for a couple of hours. We have to talk about trauma-informed care. Are our educators trauma-informed? I was there that morning till about 940, waiting on his principal. I saw five students come into that office who broke down and nobody in the office either paid attention or had what the to capacity do. to address it. We got to do better. And I'm not blaming the educators because we know their hands are full. I'm blaming those who make the decisions. Now that it's happened in your neighborhood around your children, now you want these the us to 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 um, take a stance and to stop the violence. But these sheriff's deputies don't live in the neighborhoods with these children that they're policing. <laughs> these police officers don't live in these neighborhoods that they're trying to police. And I blame some people in our community too because they're standing up wanting um, metal detectors. We know that, that those solutions aren't effective. So we have to unlearn some things, primarily <laughs> in the black community, we have to learn that we can pray and we can pray and seek therapy as a family, as an individual. We can pray and discuss our problems. We don't have to be ashamed of those things. We can pray and. We are, and, and this is no offense to any of the, the, the ministers that are on this Zoom, any ministers that are watching, but in the Black community, that's all a lot of us have been taught, that pray about it, it'll change things. Yes, it will but there are therapists out here who can also help us change the here and now because our children are hurting emotionally. And until we address the trauma that we've all said, it's happening in our communities, our black and brown communities, until we address that trauma and we talk about the cultural competency that David talked about earlier, we're gonna to continue to see these issues. And we have to know that black people are not monolithic. We can pray and whatever that and is, is what we're on this call to discuss. There have been some questions in the chat. What's next? I'm pretty sure we're going to address that. So the ands, we all have to come together, figure that out. And yes, we need the resources so we can do these things fast. So the city needs to understand that we need the funds. But I hate to reference back in the day. Back in the day, we got it done and I feel we can continue to do it. We just have to understand we can pray and. That's good, sister. Yeah, who's calling my name? This is Brother Efren Warren. Yes, I just wanted to make a comment to what Sister Mi Mika? Misha. Misha? Yeah. <laughs> I hope I'm pronouncing it right. <laughs> Sister uh, Misha said, I think it was something key in terms of the educators. Um, Brother David and Brother uh, Atimus, um, last week, um, there was a situation at one of the local high schools that's having some challenges and um, the incident started in school, but it spilled out, of course, into the community. And because of our work and the work of many others, we have our ear to what's going on in the streets. And so we picked up on this situation that escalated to the point where it involved guns. And as Brother David, Brother Papa, myself, responded, it was very intense. Uh, they followed up through the weekend and then we had some subsequent follow-up with the school that the incident initially occurred at that literally could have spilled into bloodshed. I'm just giving you an idea of how, how this looks in, the re in real time. And so Brother David and Brother Papa 
made some calls and communications with some families uh, to reach out to the parties that were involved to try to de-escalate that situation. Uh, and then the follow-up, we had an opportunity to go into this particular school and talk to the administrators and the educators. You know, the minister said, he who prescribes for you the diameter of your thinking will determine the circumference of your activity. So the more knowledge you have, the more you know and the more you can do. And what we found, Reverend Ford, and why I wanted to uh, 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 horseback on what Sister James was saying is that in our discussion with these educators, they were very, very sincere and they were very eager to learn. And what we shared with them was those cultural nuances that sometimes our educators may not be aware of, right? And we found that they were receptive to what we had to say and were asking, where have you all been? I wish you were here months ago. And our response is, we've been in the streets. <laughs> but what I found out is that there are individuals who are gatekeepers who these institutions, including our educational institutions, go to to lean to for advice and consultation, but they are not getting the real. And so we were able to offer that. And that situation was de-escalated. No one went to jail. No one was harmed. These two individuals are back in school. And of course, there's still follow up because a lot of times, even if you squash the beef with the individual involved, it's the peers on the outside still pushing it on IG, right? So I just wanted to say that, that I think our educators uh, would be willing and uh, to receive those of us who truly have a pulse of what's going on in the community among our youth to really you know, begin to explain to them really what's going on outside of these nice glossy terms. That's right. I think you're right, brother. Thank you so much for sharing that insight. Pastor Bates, can you address this question? The Man Up uh, program, is that something that you all do uh, over in Rowan County on the elementary school level? What are your thoughts on, you know, introducing that uh, with the youngest of our children? Um, <clears throat> yes, um, as I said, it was originally, well, it's called Man Up Money because we started on Mondays um, to motivate. Let me stop. First, let me um, tell you thank you for this invitation. Uh, yes, you are also moderator um, yes. in keeping us on task. Um, to Mother James, I want to say uh, thank you for giving me my sermon title for Sunday, Pray Ann, because I'm coming at it. Um, and, and, and just the entire panel, man, I, I, I could pay for this education. I feel like I got a PhD tonight. And so um, it's rich. And so we can put it into action. But to answer your question, we started on Mondays um, because that's when the students dra drug in school every Monday. We, to, we say we get the week started right, the rest of the week will go well. Um, but now with 16 different schools in the county, um, we have to go Monday through Thursday. Um, and we normally spend three to four hours um, uh, throughout the day in the school. But to address your question, to address your question, um, yeah, we started in the elementary schools. Um, in Rowan County, um, 10 years ago, in the five elementary schools, there were a total of seven African-American males, a total, a total. We took it to the superintendent, talked to him about it. And while they drug their feet, we said, we're going to do something about it. We're going to stand in there. We get a call from uh, the elementary school. Um, we have an emergency. We have a gang problem uh, um, spilled over from the middle school. And we need to address it today because they're threatening the teacher. Teacher found out and they were gonna, uh, had started threatening her. But we get there, you would laugh about this, but it's not funny. 
the name of the gang was BK Gang. And we said, well, you know, what, what is that? Come to find out the name of the gang was Burger King Gang. And, <laughs> and so we, we asked him, what y'all gonna do? Steal some fries? Well, I mean, what y'all gonna do? It's not funny, um, but that's what we were. Um, to do one even better than that, we are in daycares and head starts. We are in daycares and head starts because simply the daycare director called and said, my young men are getting out of hand. Wow. We get there. Yeah, we get there and they have, you know, dress up day where they let them go over there and put the hats and stuff on. And little guy put the hat on, idolizing. Somebody said idolizing. Put the hat on. He put the rings on his finger, put the thing around his uh, uh, neck, had the cell phone standing in the corner and was going, uh -uh, blah, 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 blah. I said, man, you can't say that. That's what my daddy says. I get on the young people about, I say, whatever you put in their spirit, the moms and, and, and uh, the words that we say, you know, I, 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 it, it irks me when a parent say they bad. No, they're not bad. Uh -uh, we're not gonna go with that. So we, we on that level too, the daycare and the head starts. And so um, now uh, some of the ones that we worked with in elementary are nine high school. We got a code, uh, that relationship, uh, brother Quick. Uh, what's up? And they respond, man up. Anywhere in the community. If you hear what's up, they respond, man up. And sometimes that lets, uh, the parents don't even know us, but that lets us know that they wanna talk to us and they wanna pull us to the side. But yeah, um, that's, that's our main focus right now is to work with the, uh, the elementary school, middle school and high school, the filler schools that work with those, because we see that culture that somebody talked about culture, we see that same uh, uh, mentality. And the other thing we do is uh, we say, I am somebody, and so are you. They, that's that's, right. that's, that's where you. we leave it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Pastor Bates. That's tremendous. And that really is, uh, we have a number of questions that touch on kind of what are next steps and how do we put this, all this conversation into practice. And I think, frankly, I'm, I'm so <laughs> grateful that Brother F. Juan pulled you into this. Uh, this man up program that you all are doing in Rowan County in one version or another uh, needs to be integrated into some of what we are talking about uh, doing here. So, so we're going to definitely, uh, you know, be keeping you in the conversation as well. Yes, sir. There, there are two questions in the Q and A that I am going to call on because they're kind of loaded questions. Um, we're, we're short on time, but I, I think out of respect, we need to try to honor these two questions in particular. Uh, the first one uh, is uh, how do you feel if a minor got arrested being in high school or middle school, but also gets taken down by a force that isn't needed by the police? What's y'all's thoughts on minors getting forced down by the SRO of the schools and many other police? Uh, we know there have been a number of incidents with this over the years. Dr. Mendez and late Dr. Eversley and I stood on a hill by ourselves for a minute uh, around Raquel Baldwin a few years ago. Um, and there have been other incidents more recently. Uh, Reverend Dr. Melvin Sampson was Facebook Live and about an incident that happened at one of our local schools. Um, so I want to ask um, for someone to speak to that question. David Villard, I see you raising your hand. So I'm going to go to you if you can speak to that question, please. For some reason, law enforcement feels that we have the right to, or, or they have the rights, I'm sorry, not we, they have the rights to act upon and, and, and do things, you know, and, and treat us individuals in the society, the youth, especially these young kids nowadays with roughness and, and toughness and, 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 you know, putting hands on them and stuff like that instead of talking to them and finding out what's really going on. When an individual is mad and upset is for a reason, instead of finding out what it is, they become confrontational. They get in their face. They say things. And when the individual and everybody starts getting louder and louder, everybody, then they start feeling threat. Yeah. Um, I hear so much lately talking about, you know, the therapists and having therapists um, in, in schools and all this type of stuff to talk to them and find out. 
I've been doing mental health for over 13 years. And I've dealt with some of the roughest kids. I've dealt with some of the high risk kids, some of the individuals in this community who either been victim or they're the ones committing the crimes. To an extent, they teach us NCI training. NCI training is so important. I don't understand why law enforcement can't practice that, but health educators and, and therapists and stuff like that are required to have that knowledge and have that understanding of NCI training where you can be able to de-escalate a situation, a situation, prevent an individual from harming himself or harming others, being able to take them down without hurting them and stuff like that. And then what makes them think that when one does it, four or five more who are back up come and they don't want to ask questions what's going on. They're just jumping on them, knees on their back, roughing them up, putting handcuffs. Oh, I'm not going to let you do that to me. And I understand why the kids do that. You're not going to stay here, rough me up, beat me up. And you don't even know what's really going on. Like, yeah, I'm going to fight back. Yeah, I'm going I'm to fight for my freedom and stuff like that. And they press more excessive force for no reason. Like in the schools, you are nobody's daddy to sit here and do that. You are nobody's child to, to sit here and allow somebody to beat you up. So of course they're gonna retaliate. Yeah, they're gonna step up and get mad and angry. These, these officers don't have the cultural competency, and I'm gonna keep saying that, cultural competency to understand an individual, why he's mad, what he's going through, and why he's acting the way he's acting. And then it results to violence. And you <coughs> acting, you're supposed to be okay with it? Go on now. You don't get paid to rough people up. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Valerie Glass definitely wants you to weigh in on this as well before I uh, go to the other question. Um, sure, yeah, I completely agree with David um, that what one of the things under one of the most recent incidents that happened, I don't, read a report in the newspaper um, and they quoted our sheriff talking about how he de-escalated the situation. Um, and this is the one that we heard the report from the witness on Facebook Live. And, and I think anyone else who understands what the word de-escalation means would know that like, that's not de-escalation. Um, I feel that, you know, oftentimes they, they're operating from a, just a different mindset. And it is one that does, is, doesn't need to be in our schools. Um, like David said, it's something that they need to be able to figure out how do we talk to people? And of course, kids are gonna respond their kids, we're the ones who were supposed to be modeling for them how to handle these situations. And when we go in with force, they're gonna respond with force. Like, but um, the adults are really the ones who need to be modeling that. And, and I think SROs come in with a, a mindset. They have a set of tools um, and they use the tools that they have and they have a set of training. Um, and I think that that training is often very detrimental to the students and then, it takes over so that all of these other things, the, the therapists, the counselors that are in the school, um, the other people who want to get to the bottom of it, it, they're not able to do that because now it's in the hands of the SRO um, and it's going to take a different turn. And so all of the other efforts of looking at the social and emotional aspects, looking at that trauma, those can't be addressed now. Um, that, that opportunity is gone. Um, and then I, if you don't mind, if I just say one second, one other question was asking about the use of police in restorative practices. And simply because of that, that mindset, that's not something they can just kind of turn off and turn on. And that could be a very harmful mindset to bring into a restorative practice with the youth um, where it could end up causing um, more harm for the youth. So I would say like the use of um, law enforcement in restorative justice practices would be something to be very careful about considering how you would bring them in. And most of the times I would say def not be something that would be needed or some not something that would add to that conversation simply because in our conversations with um, what we've, you know, conversations we've had, it's, they, it's not easy for them to just kind of turn off that mindset that they operate from. That's good, that's good, thank you. Um, another question here that certainly brings in that historical perspective that we know is so important. And again, this is a bit loaded. Don't want to take too much time on it. Dr. Mendez, perhaps you want to weigh in on a question that was asked early on this evening. Our people have always been oppressed, but these behaviors we are seeing now were never accepted. Then what are we going to do to address how desegregation destroyed us and what your thoughts might be on that? 
Yeah. Um, I work with the Poor People's Campaign. And while we have, you know, local um, motion, a lot of local right. motion going on, we have to continue to fight against policies that cause the oppression, that aggravate. And Sister James, I really appreciate your comments um, earlier. Um, it, we got to fight on many different levels. Um, and while you know some people may be dealing with this, this, but also we can't forget the role of corporate and government in continuing to perpetuate the nature of oppression. We need to call it yes. out. We need to call it out. Um, and these policies create the tension that goes on in our community. Like for instance, uh, voter suppression and whatnot. Um, we have to continue to fight in that struggle. We have to continue to defend families and young people who are victims of this kind of oppression. There's a big move right now against um, critical race theory. What is it about the truth that has happened to our people that this society wants to continue to hide and act like it doesn't exist? Um, it's important that the truth be told. As my Native American friends tell me, we have to go back to the beginning and understand how it all happened and how it continues uh, to happen. And um, I think his, of all things, Malcolm always said, of all things, history rewards us best. So I think we have to address those issues, particularly to fight for the truth and to get the truth out there. Does it make you popular? No. Well, I don't get invited to a lot of things and that's cool with me, but I'm still gonna tell the truth. Go ahead, Doc. Um, and, and, um, and fight for the truth because that's, really the only thing that's going to liberate this society as a whole. That's Since right. Trump came in and started attacking the truth, um, he was like what everybody was waiting for, you know, this leader to come and lead us back into a racist path. It looks so much right now, like following 1877, after reconstruction to put people of color back into their places of subordination, submissiveness. Thank you so much. And all the progress that we have made um, over these, these years. I mean, that's the, um, on purpose. It's not as if um, it's something that's accidental but we have to fight on many different levels. And the struggle for human rights, I don't deal that much with civil rights anymore, but human rights, the dignity of people, the humanity, I consider myself a Christian humanist where the mm -hmm. struggle mm -hmm. is about humanizing right. the society, humanizing, um, our young people, because yes, um, somebody said it earlier, and I and, and I agree one hundred percent that because this is a violent society and whatnot, our young people don't have any other way of resolving their issues. I proposed yes. some years ago 
that it was important that we teach in the school system nonviolence. And when I say nonviolence, I'm not talking about a strategy for civil rights and whatnot, but predicated on the sacredness of life, the sacredness of the earth, the sacredness of our humanity to respect that. If in fact you respect the person, you can't hurt that person. That's but right. It's only after you dehumanize that person, like if we call our women bitches or call our women hoes, et cetera, you open the door to hurt them. That's right. That's, That's right. where domestic violence begins at the level of dehumanization. But if we can teach our young people, um, and basically all religions understand it, that you are somebody, the sacredness of life, the sacredness of the earth, the sacredness of, of family, et cetera. We respect those things. You can't hurt that which you respect. You can only hurt that which has been dehumanized and made to not matter. That's right. And that's right. I still think that's something we ought to push in the schools. The sacredness of life, the sacredness yes. Of, yes. of each other. That's right. And as Thank a humanist, you. that's what I'm pushing. All right, Doc. Thank you. Thank you. Another sermon there. So listen, we are coming toward the end of our time. Um, I wanna thank all of our panelists. Uh, we have had a tremendous conversation here. Thank God this has been recorded. And so we will be making uh, the recording of this available to all of those of you who have tuned in. I do wanna note, uh, Brother Hawkins had to leave earlier, but they have an important event coming up, uh, the Push Out documentary, the title of the film is called Push Out. And that documentary is going to be shown with a panel discussion to follow on November 20th, which will be sometime next week, November 20th, uh, 6 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. You can go online um, and get tickets, uh, lit-city.ticketleap.com. Uh, somebody maybe can put that in the uh, chat room, uh, the link to that. But we do want to encourage folks to look at participating in that. Sister Jana Minor, are you still here? Um, and I do see uh, board member Motzinger opining as well. Thank you so much for being here. We had a school board member from Alamance County uh, who was tuning in as well uh, to glean uh, some insight, uh, you know, for situations going on over there because this is not just a Winston issue. Uh, this is all over the nation, all around the world issue. Sister Jane Amina, if you're still here, I want to ask you to uh, issue a call to action here relative to women's gun violence prevention coalition which will help to address the questions that were asked in a number of different ways what do we do next how do we take this thing kind of on a citywide level how do we institutionalize uh, some of this work so that we don't miss the moment and don't lose the momentum that we have been able to put in place in the past as Dr. Mendez and others talked about but that we have not been able to sustain which is what has brought us back to this moment again hi everyone um i'm janae and um, yes, I'm the synchronizer for the Women's Gun Violence Prevention Coalition. Um, our next one thing that we definitely all need to do is to remember to come together and to be able to work with each other. Um, we are all leaders in this community and everybody has their own part. Um, one of the main things that the Women's Gun Violence Prevention does is we support our grassroots organizations. As we know, they are the boots on the ground and they have um, person, in-person contact with our community and they know how to bring the solutions about. Um, I'm also the founder of the Liberment Adventure Park. And as um, Pastor Mendez was saying, we have to teach our children value, that they are valuable. And um, we have um, to focus on teaching them why they are valuable and the powers that they have within themselves as well. Um, we are doing a lot of community events. We are also in contact with our stakeholders. So we all just pretty much mostly need to come together and work together to uh, provide the solutions and show the solutions to our children. 
thank you so much. Thank you so much. And we really want to encourage everyone here to learn more about the work of women's gun violence prevention um, and to support uh, their efforts as they move forward seeking to uh, secure the level of funding and support that we are going to need to really carry this work forward. Once again, I want to thank all of our panelists um, who were here uh, on tonight. I want to thank the staff for Action for Equity, in particular, our executive director, the one and only Kelly P. Easton, Mary Pat Thomas, who is our uh, newly brought on deputy director for grants and communications. Uh, Pretty Ricky Johnson has been on here as well, and all those others who helped uh, to make this happen. Kelly, do you have any uh, final notes to share with us before we wrap things up here this evening? I would just like to turn it over to um, Valerie Glass, um, who is who has just been an extraordinary partner to Action for Equity and doing this work, bringing expertise and just a great amount of authenticity, um, you know, around restorative practices and being able to provide alternative solutions to our youth. Um, so um, thank you, Valerie. And yes, if you can offer some words. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was just going to add some closing remarks. Um, just say thank you to Reverend Ford for facilitating this discussion. Um, and there, are, thank you to all the panelists. There are a lot of um, really powerful voices um, on this panel tonight, and um, I'm humbled to be um, to be part of that discussion. Um, but really, no, I can't really add much more than what we've already said tonight. So just kind of tying things together um, to just you know kind of talk about how much. We're all in this um, and it takes, there's so many different needs that are out there and we need lots of different approaches. Um, there's not one single um, answer to this discussion and it's this collaboration of all of us doing this work and inviting the community to, to join with us in this work. And I know that there's a lot of volunteer opportunities out there um, for those organizations that are represented today. I know there are support needs. So if you're in a place where you can give support, um, to please um, to do that, to help these be the community, to be as um, Terrence Hawkins said at the beginning, how are we building this loving and just village? And, and that starts with us. And so doing what we can um, as we are building on these policies and these greater structure issues too, what can we be doing right now um, to, to build this village together? So thank you guys so much. Thank you so much. And I want to draw people's attention to the chat room where all of the details of the information that you need, the links to support uh, the proposal of the Women's Gun Violence Prevention to the county commissioners for funding that would back the work of, of guys like David Villada and Papa and Brother Efeguan um, and others um, in a way that it just simply has not been supported uh, before. Make sure that you take that information down, cut and paste it uh, onto your own devices, uh, click on those links, uh, get that ID number down so that you can call uh, to the county commissioners meetings that are upcoming uh, in support of this proposal. Uh, Brother Efeguam, I'm going to let you weigh in here and have the last word, brief word, as we close out, and then we're going to bid you all adieu and just encourage you to um, stay in the struggle and stay in support of what we are doing here. But that's one. If, he, if he's gonna have a, a yes. final word, can I say something right quick? Pardon me, brother minister. <laughs> All right. All right, I'll go, to go ahead, Mayor, real quick. And then brother right quick, real quick. Um, I've, I, I just dared in my heart and I needed to say this right quick, um, just to, to, to the knowledge of everything, everything that everybody's doing in this community. Um, I applaud all the programs. I applaud everything that everyone is trying. Um, one thing that everybody's talking about is the gangs and the gangs and the gangs and stuff like that. I'm not sure if too many people understand or even know, we've tried to make it aware now that yes, we know that right now we're at the highest we've been in homicides in the last 25 years. But thanks to Brother Ephraim Muhammad, thanks to Papa, Thanks to myself, Sister Nikita, local um, bail bonds agencies, um, local um, business owners. We built a coalition last year because we were sick and tired of the bullshit in our streets. But not only that, because certain individuals like the Hispanic gangs, all the Sureños, for whatever reason, a month after, five weeks after, two young men were killed down Cove Road Village. 
they said, we want to try to do a peace. We sat there, we listened to them. We facilitated and mediated the situation. And here it is now, 13 months later, and there still has not been one homicide or one drive-by credited to the Hispanic gangs, not only in the South Side, but here in Winston-Salem, okay, that could add to what the violence in all the situation is. I say that to say that if we can do that with those young individuals, and they're the ones who did the work, they're the ones who upholded the peace and loved themselves, we could do the same thing with the individuals around the east side, the north side, in the schools and all that. We need help, we need assistance, we need resources to do all this type of stuff. It's not easy because not everybody's going to abide by it, okay? But I say all that to say that there is hope. There's hope. We have to continue. We can't give up on them. We can't give up on, on, on situations just because certain individuals want help in our systems. And I applaud everybody. I say thank you for every, everything y'all do. And um, I'm just here to work. I'm here to work. So if I can be help and assistance to anybody, um, I'm here for it. Thank you and love y'all. Bless you, brother. Love you too. Brother Afeguan, it's to you, man. Well, thank you, uh, Reverend uh, Ford. I, I, I was kind of caught off guard because I didn't know I was going to be saying anything in terms of closing it out. But I can say that I'm deeply humbled um, by being a part of this tonight with all of these brilliant men and women who sincerely want to see our city and our county transformed. You know, there are individuals who say we want to go back to some normalcy. Uh, you know, since the pandemic. But you know, what's norm normal is, is, rel is a relative term. We don't want to go back before the pandemic to failing and underfunded schools. We don't want to go back to the systemic issues that were there before the pandemic. We have an opportunity with the minds that are in this Zoom and those who are listening in to really do something that has never been done in this city and this county that can serve as a model for the entire nation. The only thing that we have to do is fight to stay united. And in our unity is more powerful than any weapon, more powerful than a hydrogen and atomic bomb. And unity is not uniformity. I'm not going to be you, you're not going to be me. But unity is different people doing different things at different times for the same common cause. And so I am definitely inspired, Reverend Ford, by what the love that has been displayed tonight. And we wanna take this throughout our city. And we are prayerful that God will give us the support that we need because what man can't do, he's more than able to do. And I believe deeply in my heart that he's doing that tonight. He's going to do it tomorrow and he's going to do it some more. So in terms of solutions, there is a proposal much like what my good friend and pastor Timothy shared here in Forsyth County that has been submitted before the Forsyth County School Board. And we hope the educators, the board members that are listening in and the community will support that effort. So let us stay united, let us not be divided, and let us do this for our community, especially our young people. They are hurting, but they need us, and we are the example that can change some of what we talked about tonight. So thank you, and may Allah God bless all of us with the light of understanding. Thank you. God bless you, brother. And we're gonna God pray and thank you. keep on doing what we're doing, amen. You all have a wonderful evening. Thank you again, brothers, sisters, and all of those who, you, uh, who have attended. We'll see you soon. Let's stay on the path. Let's stay together. Let's keep working. All right.